All right. Welcome, everyone. It is 5.15. We are going to get started. I'm Michelle Glauser. I am a community developer at Twilio, among many other things. So I'm so happy to see all of you. Thanks for coming. Uh, we are very excited to have Bear and Chloe speak to us today. So please give them a warm welcome. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks, everybody. Um, we're really excited to talk to you today a little bit about the lessons that we've learned as Slack the platform from seeing over a 1,000 apps built on Slack. And Chloe's going to share some insights that she at Sentry learned when they were building their app for Slack. So first of all, who am I? Hi, I'm Bear. I lead developer relations at Slack. And broadly speaking, it's our job to write developer documentation, build developer tools, and do educational events that help anyone who's interested in writing a Slack app do it effectively, easily, and with help from us. So on our app directory, there are over 1,500 apps listed right now. And most paid teams are actively using apps. 94% of them are actively using at least one app for their day-to-day -day work. And when you think about the types of apps that we see on our platform versus other consumer platforms like Facebook or Twitter or Line or WeChat, there are different problems that you're trying to solve for that audience. The first thing that's different is that you're trying to help people get work done. So they're interested in doing different kinds of tasks. First, they're more task oriented. And two, people don't come to Slack apps to do things like browse on a store. They're more interested in getting from point A to point B in some sort of workflow. The other thing that you have for certain is that users are highly engaged. When people are using Slack, they're actively talking to their coworkers, and they tend to be in Slack for multiple hours a day doing that. The other thing that's very particular to Slack is that when you're doing any sort of conversational interface, it happens in the context of a group rather than in a one-on-one -on -one interaction with an individual user. So it's not like being in a DM. It's not like uh, having a thread with somebody in Facebook Messenger. You have to think about how your app is interacting not just with the person who first initiated the contact, but with all the people who might be listening inside a channel. So on the right hand, you can see how StatsBot handles this by taking some of the more conversational aspects to a thread where there's a smaller set of people who are interested in, in engaging in that back and forth. So just to level set what we're talking about, what can apps actually do inside Slack? We think about it in terms of workflows, and workflows have three phases. There's a kickoff, there's some sort of action that the user has to take, and then hopefully there is a wrap-up conclusion, like a, a reflection in the UI that, good job, you did the thing that you set out to do. So when you're kicking off a workflow, there are a few ways that users can initiate contact with apps inside Slack. They might get a notification, and that's what you see in the upper left-hand corner. There are ways that you can find apps directly through a slash command. And those are familiar interfaces for people who are developers. Say writing slash and then some sort of action verb and some parameters is really familiar for developers, less so for users. So what we try and do is find other places where people have points of entry to talk to apps, like in the left-hand sidebar where you find other conversations. One of the places that we found people have in even better time finding ways to interact with Slack is in the overflow section of an individual message. So the real stars of the show in building any Slack app are the buttons, drop-down menus, and dialogues that let people actually get work done in other services. So when you click a button, you assume that some action is being taken. When you submit information through a dialog, that lets uh, a developer capture that and then send it into a third-party service, which is, at the end of the day, the point. You're trying to get work done in some other service. And this uh, piece that we have on the left-hand side, we call an app action. It's one of the most discoverable places that people can find apps, where if you long press on mobile or if you hover over a message on the upper right-hand corner of a Slack message, you have this overflow context menu that lets you connect with an app. So if Chloe and I are talking about a task, like we need to update slide 46 on our presentation, I can long press on that and then have it pop up in a dialog and send that maybe to Jira or to Trello if I'm trying to track that as part of a task. So these are the kinds of things that we see people building a lot inside Slack. And we have some pretty strong opinions about what actually belongs inside Slack. And the way we think about it internally even applies to Slackbot. 
we have a flowchart with a set of rules about how we approach communicating with users inside our own messaging platform. And you might notice that Slackbot doesn't ping you with marketing messages. Slackbot isn't the thing that tells you when there's a new update to the client. And if you want to see this flowchart in more detail, it's available on our API site, uh, search api.slack.com slash best practices, and there's there's this flowchart in full. But so we try to be thoughtful about what Slackbot is actually for. And when it comes to third-party apps, the thing that we want all of you to think about is what qualifies as quick and contextual work. When you're thinking about writing a spreadsheet, like maybe you're trying to develop a model for forecasting next quarter's earnings, that's not really something that should happen inside a chat client, right? That's something that's deep work that you spend a lot of time on in a tool that is suited for doing that work specifically. What we think belongs in Slack is the quick contextual work, meaning context, contextual meaning in the context of conversation, it totally makes sense for when Chloe and I are talking about our presentation for me to task something up that's related to the presentation. So a great example of somebody who does this well is Polly. Polly is a tool for creating polls inside your Slack team that can help you gather feedback on whether you liked the presentation you just saw or whether you should go to a certain place for lunch. And what they found is that by adding this all inside Slack, poll creation is pretty quick. It only takes a couple of minutes. And so completion rates tend to be pretty high because people can do it fast and it makes sense to send that poll to a group of people you're talking to. Another company that does this really well is an app called Rike. They're a task manager and note-taking app that makes it really quick to just task something up after you've talked to a friend. Just pop a dialog inside Slack, write a couple of pieces of notes in the form, and then send it off to Rike where it gets stored longer term. You're not completing the task, you're just writing it up and recording it for later. And you see benefits for doing that in a way that can be quickly completed and also operates in conversational context. When Polly used to bounce people out to add comments to a poll, they had to do that in a browser window, um, the experience was fine and they were seeing some comments get added to polls. But when they built that into Slack with a dialogue, again, you get that quick contextual feedback, that increased nearly 300% the number of people who were commenting on tasks in Slack. And that's something that we see pretty commonly across the board. If you bring in the sorts of uh, really easy to do lightweight things into a UI that feels lightweight, you get higher completion rates and people tend to be happier and more engaged overall. So we've learned a few things in seeing all of these 1500 apps built about what's effective at getting entire teams using the app inside Slack. Again, it's very different from just trying to win one user at a time when you're working on a consumer platform. You might have one installing user, but then you need to turn that user into your best advocate to get the whole team using your app and not just one person. So an app that's done this really well is Disco, formerly known as Grobot. And what they've done is write up instructions as part of their onboarding process that equips the installing user to help spread the use of Disco throughout the team. So it says a little bit about what Disco does. Thanks for adding me. Next step is to add me to a channel. And you can decide whether you want to use the standard installation script that Disco provides, or you can uh, change it up. You can edit it so that it feels more like your team and something that feels friendly and like they'd like to use. And so the way that Disco used to first get discovered was just through slash commands. They built a slash command, and after one person installed it, if you happen to be typing slash into the, into the Slack entry box, slash commands pop up and people will be like, oh, Disco, that's really interesting, what's that? And with that, they got 15% conversion. But when they added message buttons and some of this installing script, that bumped up to 28%. And when instead of using buttons, they actually added a dropdown for choosing channels that the app should be added to, it bumped all the way to 42%. So these little tweaks turn out to be not so little after all. They're really impactful in the way that people learn about your app and understand how to use it. So along the way, we've also seen some really uh, interesting apps that work really hard to have uh, personality inside Slack, and we've also seen some apps that are very dry. The actual text of your message can have uh, a really big bearing on how people interact with your app. So our general rule is to keep content clear and succinct. When you're working on a message canvas, it's like when you went from web to mobile, you had to compact everything down. Mobile to message is another layer of getting compactor, more and more compact. So when you think about what a message looks like in Slack, you want it to be as glanceable 
as possible. And that's a term I first heard when they're launching the, the Apple Watch, like glanceable, that's a good word. Because you wanna be able to let people scan it without having to read every single piece of text to understand what this is. So this is a message from Ops Genie. And one of the things that Ops Genie does well is that it keeps the actual text here pretty succinct. It's only the content of the alert. Uh, and then they highlight key actions at the bottom. So here, your default action is close, and that's why it's colored green. So your eye is drawn to it, and you know, okay, I've gotten the message, I can just close it. But they have that drop-down menu for other actions if people want to. Another good thing about, another good practice when you're trying to make things glanceable and easy to click is to use defaults. So here's a coffee bot where somebody might be ordering coffee on a regular basis. And if they are always coming to you for a latte, you shouldn't have to have them go through a drop down every single time where they specify, I want a latte, not an Americano. I want this type of milk. I want it extra hot, whatever it is. You can just remember, the last time you ordered this, do you want to reorder that? And then otherwise, put them through a flow that has a longer set of commands to enter what they want. Part of being glanceable, too, is communicating with color. On the left-hand side, you'll notice that there's a, a bar that we use to indicate that everything in there is considered an attachment to the message. It's, uh, it's a way of just showing that this can be edited in place and that it's an extra part of a message. And with that sidebar color, you can let people know that something is resolved or has uh, more intense uh, consequences by having the color red in there. There's a lot that you can do to make it more glanceable with color. One thing that's specific to Slack is thinking about how you want your message to live on in channel after an interaction has been completed. And this goes back to the idea of the fact that apps are in conversation not just with a single person, but with groups of people. So we've got an example here of an app called Lunch Train that we actually use inside Slack to uh, find people to go to lunch with. It's pretty straightforward, but what you do as the initiator of the lunch train is you call slash lunch train and you specify a place that you want to go and a time that you want to go. And when people inside the channel see this message, there's a button that says board the train. So if I'm catching this message before people have actually left, you would expect that I should be able to click that button. But after the train has already left, it wouldn't make much sense if that message still let me board the train, right? So what Lunch Train does is it removes that message and then it adds one that has a long-lived life in the channel that says, here's a record of what happened with that Lunch Train. And that's something that is really important for apps that can get a little bit noisy. If you're communicating back and forth with a user about, say, how to configure a particular marketing uh, dashboard that they want reported into Slack, you don't want to have pages and pages of pages of conversation that were all about getting to one end result. You can concatenate that down into one succinct message that lives on a little bit longer. That said, there are cases when having a paper trail and breadcrumbs along the way are actually really important. So in the case of Ops Genie, they do keep that message up there longer lived. And then at the bottom, there's a note saying who acknowledged this alert and the number of the alert but the upper message still sticks around because other people might be interested in following that paper trail along the way. So it's not going to be a hard and fast rule for every single app. You should be thinking about what should stay in channel and what you can remove to give people the best context about what happened in your app and what they still need to know. So we also have a feature called ephemeral messages that are really useful for when you only want to talk to one user inside the channel. You only want them to see that message and you shouldn't create noise for other people. What ephemeral messages are really useful for are things like responses to immediate actions. So the case that this very fast GIF is going through here, we'll break it down in a second, is Bruce is telling Karishma, hey, we have a meeting with Big Co CIO. And Karishma is wondering, okay, who is that? What account details can I get about Big Co? And so she enters in, the command to search Salesforce for Bigco. And she gets a set of results that are only visible to her. And when she finds out, oh, yep, this is the one I want, she can click show details, confirm that it's the right one, and then post it to the conversation. So here, Bruce doesn't need to see that intermediate step of the search result. He just gets to see, oh, okay, here's the account detail, and they can continue their conversation from there. Ephemeral messages are really useful for, for that kind of case when you know the user is present and still communicating with you, and it's a great way to, to tamp down some of the noise. So these are some of the mechanisms that we've seen work really well. 
but a lot of the copy, a lot of the changes that you can make to make your app more effective are really just at the level of copy. Um, good copywriting can make your results so much better, and we wish that more and more people would actually A-B test the copy that they use. It's really easy to think that you've totally nailed clarity of communication when you write something once, but testing it out can really net you big benefits. So our general rules of thumb are about being clear, concise, and human. And that can be sometimes uh, more, more difficult than, than it sounds at first blush. So we see a lot of apps on the platform that are working really hard to have a personality, like this app Cowgirl Cooker over here. But if you read this message, it's two lines of a joke that I maybe didn't need to read in order to find out that, oh, this message is just saying, hey, do you want to schedule your cookout? <laughs> and so for some people, reading that joke will be great. But for other people, it's going to get in the way of whether or not they're having a good time reading your app, because this isn't glanceable at all. You had to stand there and read and be like, what is this actually saying? Oh, ready to schedule your cookout. OK, yes. There are also things that we find where um, uh, concatenating this down, of course, this is just easier to read, and people can jump straight to the point. Um, Another thing that we see people doing to add personality, which can sometimes backfire, is using emoji in place of words. So if you read this message, yippee ki -yay, Sarah's having a fire meet. <laughs> Do I want to mosey on over? What does mosey mean? I'm not a native speaker of English. I, even if I am a native speaker in English, what does, what does mosey on over mean? Valdez is coming, cool. And then the buttons here, yeehaw, what does, what does yeehaw mean? Am I agreeing to something or I'm just <laughs> expressing enthusiasm? Yes. Good that she's having a fire meet. So, <laughs> so when you're trying to, to add personality to your messages, that's A-OK. -okay. Add all the emoji you want, but also use words. Because emoji can have very different meanings in different cultural contexts. Words tend to be relatively reliable. So in here, yippee ki -yay, we can still add that phrase. That's still full of personality, and it's fun. Sarah's having a cookout, emoji, that's also still fun, but it's clear what we're saying here. And then we're going back to best practice copy for buttons, which is to use the verb of whatever you're asking somebody to do to confirm what happens when they click. So either you're agreeing attend, not yeehaw, attend, or tarnation, no, decline. And that just makes it a lot clearer and easier for people to understand. And actually tweaking your copy can yield pretty powerful results. One of the things that we heard from an app on our, our platform, Paperbot, was that when they were adding this line that was pretty straight to the point, it converted at 42%. When they played around with the copy and they tried to help people, encourage people to think outside the one or two channels that a bot might get added to, that conversion rate jumped to 64%. So copy is one of the, in many ways, cheaper changes that you can make to your app. It doesn't involve changing much code. You can just swap out some of the strings and experiment to see how people respond differently. We really know and have proof that it, it yields benefits. So we encourage you to do that. But to get a little bit deeper from the platform level and go into the experience of building a single app, I'd like to invite Chloe on stage to tell you a little bit about how Sentry built their app. Hello. Hi, y'all. All right, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our bot that we have um, over at Sentry. So a little bit about me. I'm a developer evangelist at Sentry.io. Um, we're open source. Does anybody here use Sentry? People familiar? Awesome, great. So we're an open source error logging and reporting tool. We help developers monitor and fix crashes in real time. Um, we're completely open source. We believe that tools work best um, when they work together, um, which being open source, that means we get a lot of awesome integration um, integrations that work with us, and Slackbot is one of our most popular integrations. And I'm about to get into why that is in just a moment here. So what is error tracking? So all applications have errors, as much as we want to admit that our apps are built perfectly and we have flawless, bugless code. So how do we get notified of those bugs? Um, well, we can wait for a passive aggressive tweet. That's my personal favorite, like <laughs> your shit's broken. Um, we can wait for a surge of support tickets. Um, there's a couple different difficulties with this. A um, you're not going to be sure that everyone is going to submit a support ticket. I know for someone like me, I do, but my dad, who's 75, doesn't know how to do that. Um, it creates a bad user experience, and um, then you're going into the trouble of works on my machine, debugging, getting screenshots. Um, that's not fun for the user or for the developer. Um, testing helps, but even with full test coverage, 
how do you account for really bizarre use cases? And this is a fun visualization of that that I like to show. So um, if you've been to Atlanta before, this is sort of the equivalent of Muni in Atlanta. Um, and the Weather Channel has set up this lovely shot here. They're going to film the dome implosion. And this bus just conveniently stops right in front of that exact moment. And, and I highly recommend watching this on the interweb because you can hear the person cursing, going, no, bus, beep, beep, beep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's done. <laughs> so how do you account for these bizarre use cases that you never saw coming, that you didn't create tests for, that you didn't see coming in a million years, like a user putting emoji in a, te a text field? Um, how do you know what you don't know? Um, all right, so a quick show of hands out there. Um, how many people, after a long day of work, love to go home, crack open a LaCroix, maybe open a bottle of wine, and read their logs? Yeah, no one. I always get one you know, hand raised there. This talk is for you, sir. Um, <laughs> so personally, at Century, that would take a lot of LaCroix and a lot of wine. And you shouldn't have to read through them every day. Logs are a really great way to dig into an issue and debug. But we should not be reading them on a daily basis. That is not fun. And the same goes with metrics, really great tool. But you need to know what to track in order to know how to track it. Otherwise, you're going to have a fire drill each time. Um, so should you get rid of your logs? Are they useless? No, they're great, and metrics are great also. Um, they kind of help us understand. Metrics are obviously helping us understand if we have a steady heart rate, maybe if there's a spike or a drop, we need to look into something. Um, so using an error tracking tool with your, along with your metrics and along with your logs is really essential to use all of those things to their full potential, and that's what Sentry does. So we pull all of the context together in one place, so you're able to look at that and not have to context switch. Um, and setting alerting within your logs, maybe you've built something yourself, duct taped something together, um, it can be a lot like setting traps. Um, so the comparison I like to make is you have an ant problem and you have a lot of ant traps and you have a mouse trap because you have a mouse problem and then you have a squirrel and you're like, how did the squirrel get here? Um, you don't want to be doing a fire drill each time you do that. So this is, oh, here's another, we, we love squirrels over at Sentry. Um, <laughs> so um, that being said, so if you have a larger application, so the Airbnbs, the Lyfts, the Ubers of the world, where the user base is gigantic, you don't want a notification every time someone runs into a bug. That would be a lot of noise. And as developers, we don't want to be alerted of every issue that happens in our application. It'd be really noisy. So within Sentry, we have different ways to set up alerting, where if X issue affects 700 people in the span of three minutes, we want to be alerted, or maybe we have a known issue that we don't want to be alerted of. Context is really key here. Um, and as little noise as we can get as possible is best. Developers are already juggling a million things, um, and we don't want to make them context switch. So when we decided to revamp our Slack bot, we wanted to make sure that we were giving customers useful information. So this idea Bear mentioned of glanceable information. And as a developer tool, our mission is to not distract, alert, require the attention of developers unless it's really crucial and it's something they want to be alerted of. So it's important that it's not only relevant, so does it need to be sent to an individual developer versus an entire team? Um, because even at large organizations with smaller teams working on smaller projects, the you know shopping cart team does not need to know what's happening on the back end team or the front end team. So we really want to make sure that they're specific. Um, so when we decided to revamp our Slack bot, we wanted to make sure that we were giving customers useful information. We also wanted it to be actionable. And we wanted it to be specific and notify the right developers. So sort of this idea of the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And we wanted to make sure that developer journey, so to speak, was as short as possible from point A to point B. So uh, I always love to show this, especially to non-technical folks, of what it's like to interrupt a developer, just tap them on the shoulder when we're in the middle of um, programming something. And I feel the same way about alerting as well. Um, I don't want to be getting a bunch of Slack notifications while I'm working on something. Um, and this is going to also make sure that you are getting uh, the most use out of your developers. All right, so as far as creating an ideal journey is concerned, this was our, what our original Slack bot was doing. Um, so they get alerted on Slack. 
Um, they would open Slack, they'd check if the notification was relevant to them. You'd go into the Sentry UI, resolve that issue within Sentry, go back to Slack, update and notify the team of the fix, and then try to remember what the heck you were doing before. Um, that's not ideal. Um, we really wanted to make sure that this was more specific. No, <laughs> I always forget I put that animation there. Um, so this is now our new Slack bot. Um, we have a Slack alert. The developer will open Slack. They can resolve the issue within Slack, and then they can resume their work afterward. Um, and obviously, because we have the ability within Sentry to make sure that the alerts are specific and relevant to the developer, that they're only getting notified and alerted when they should really be. Yay! We like GIFs a lot at Sentry. <laughs> um, so there are a lot throughout this presentation. So um, here's a little bit of what it looked like before. Um, we really felt that our developers were feeling like Harry Potter, getting accepted into Hogwarts. So you'd receive the Slack notifications about errors the moment they would arise. Um, it was noisy. There was really no way to interact with our Slack chatbot. And it created a lot of context switching, a lot of noise, kind of like an an, that annoying fire alarm when the battery gets really low and it's chirping. And I'm sure we all have notification anxiety with our applications and especially with Slack. Um, so you've always been able to receive Slack notifications about errors the moment they happen, but we really wanted to make sure they were relevant. And we wanted to make sure that errors are, since they're always happening, um, we didn't want it to look like this, like Harry Potter. <laughs> so um, we took something that's usually just a siren, that's usually just something that was going on in the background, and make sure that you're only getting alerted when it matters to you personally. So to Chloe, who works on XYZ team. Um, so we added uh, interactivity into the bot. Um, so you can resolve it, you can ignore it, you can assign it to another um, developer. And you can do this without having to navigate to Sentry at all. You can do it all within Slack. And if you needed more context, of course, you can click through um, and look at that error individually. Um, you can also assign issues to Sentry teams, um, users from Slack, select who should tackle the problem directly through that Slack notification. And it'll be assigned um, into Sentry to kick off that resolution workflow. Um, by being able to solve these issues within Slack and mark it fixed, mark it as a resolve, um, that way you don't, as a developer, can be in the right headspace and not have to have multiple tabs open, look at your metrics, look at your error, dive into your logs. It can all be done right inside of Slack, which is great. Um, so when you think about your developer organization, only certain people need to know certain information. And you can filter the errors. Oops, here we go. This should be playing here. And maybe not. OK. Well, boop. Play. Awesome. There we go. So when you think of your dev org, only certain people need certain info. Um, you can filter errors about people, and they can do something about it. Um, you can send specific kinds of errors to specific channels within Slack. And then you can also have your own alert settings. So if a billing error comes up, you can send that to the billing team. Um, and an error that pops up that's thrown 100 million times <laughs> in a minute, all hands on DAC channel, sure, that would be great. So by filtering these notifications by teams, um, that way people can have ownership over the different roles um, within Sentry. So you're getting notified of the specific issues that are specific to you. Let's see if I can click through here. There we go. Oops. All right. So lessons learned from this. Um, First of all, bots shouldn't require a long journey within the app itself unless it's absolutely necessary. Also, having it interactive, we found that people were using our Slack bot a lot more. Oops, and I'm clicking through here. Um, it never felt like background noise now that we've revamped it this way. And it helped shorten that resolution time as well and not create any extra work for the developers. Um, also, by making it customizable and having multiple channels, that way it was relevant and specific to the people who were using it. Um, so. That is all from me. Um, Bear and I are going to take questions now. I believe we have a little bit. Do we go over a little bit? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> We've got one minute. Yeah, yeah we one minute. For, time for one question right there. <laughs> Winner. Yay. <laughs> hi. Uh, hi. My name's, my name's Doug. I actually work with efficiency of words used in bots. Huh? And I'd very much like to make an observation with your permission. When I work with people that work with bots and put in color, they forget about color vision deficiency. That's color true. vision deficiency, there's probably 30 people in here who can't actually see red and green, uh, uh, the division between red and green. And I noticed up there there was red and green lines. Just an observation, but it's very important. 
because uh, um, 8% of everyone who looks at a website with color can't distinguish red and green. But I love, I'd love this, it's yep. great. Absolutely, and that's part of the, the important point there too is that color should never replace words or content. In the same way that emoji should not replace words, it can be additive, it can make something more glanceable, but yes, accessibility is, should be top of mind and just using red and green is not sufficient. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, we don't have time for any questions, but feel free to talk to them after. Uh, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you.